Welcome to our video from Chapter 6, Section 5, Torsion in Beams. This shows a girder through which we've cut a section, and then perpendicular to that is an eye beam or a wide flange beam, which represents a secondary beam or a joist. The decking will be primarily supported by that member and then that member will be supported by the girder. So one way we can imagine this connection occurring between the girder and the secondary beam or the joist is to weld a fin, a steel plate to the girder and have it cantilever out and grab hold of the I-beam. So in this case we've shown it with one bolt. It might be a couple of bolts but it probably won't be very many and those bolt holes will be tend to be a little bit large so there'll be flexibility for movement which uh, may not be very desirable because if these two beams move relative to each other they could disengage from the deck uh, or damage the deck in some way but this is one conceptual way in which we might uh, imagine doing this in this case this I-beam or wide flange beam would load this end. This wide flange beam would tend to rotate under the influence of the eccentric load that's going to get delivered at that point right there. And if in fact it were a single bolt, then rotation would occur around that bolt and the I-beam would, or the wide flange uh, secondary beam would go downward and the girder would tend to rotate under the influence of that. So the two ways we could repair that problem is we could try to create a moment connection between this plate and the web of this beam by welding the plate to the beam, but that would involve some field welding. And it might even be of suspect capability, although uh, welding this to this beam essentially makes the beam continuous all the way to the center line of this girder, which then would eliminate the tendency of the girder to rotate. So we probably could get away with doing that welding operation there, and this would be in the end a satisfactory way to do it but because of the field welding that would be required there, it's generally not the method that we prefer. So this is a diagram, by the way. The center of support under this girder is on the center line of the girder. This load is an eccentric load, which has a lever arm L, which is tending to create a moment, which is tending to rotate this beam or torque the beam around its center line. Now, the loads from the secondary beam, this is the secondary beam, and this is the force it's exerting on this steel plate, which is projecting off from the girder. That load is a fairly substantial load, and then you might have several of these secondary beams, so there would be a fairly powerful tendency for this torque to rotate the primary beam. And the beam would uh, exhibit the following kind of distortion, even if it was held at the support end so that it can't rotate. And we can imagine a number of different ways that we could create a support configuration that would stop that. Um, that support configuration would cost a fair amount of money, and we would still end up with this kind of distortion because wide flanges are generally not very resistive to torsional influences. So what we're showing here is the more conventional way of making this connection. This would be the girder. This is the uh, secondary beam. Um, the secondary beam wants to reach out and attach itself to the center line of this girder. So the force it's delivering is along the same plane or in the same line uh, as the force that's supporting it the girder. So the way this is done is we might have a couple of clip angles which get welded to the secondary beam. These clip angles have bolt holes in them. There are receiving bolt holes in the girder. Um, 
this secondary beam gets maneuvered where this portion comes in underneath this flange and attaches to this web. Now, um, in addition to having to cut these uh, angles and drill those angles or punch them, and by the way, these angles can be sheared and they can be punched, and this is a very efficient, uh, rapid way of fabricating these. So these clip angles are fairly inexpensive. But we do have to modify this beam by cutting away some of the flange, which we see here. And we're doing that so that the top surface of the secondary beam will correspond to the top surface of the girder. And one of the reasons we'd like to do that is we like to have, the, whenever possible, the floor decking or roof decking that's attaching to these beams to be welded down to both the secondary beams and the primary beams in order to enhance force transfers through the diaphragm action of the corrugated decking, which might be corrugated decking by itself in the roof or corrugated decking and composite action with concrete in the case of a floor. We might also want to put shear pins welded to the top of this girder and others welded to the top of the secondary beams in order to achieve composite action between those beams and the uh, corrugated uh, and con concrete decking that's attached to them. Uh, so you might look at this and think, wow, that's a really annoying kind of... Uh, uh, modification to make to this beam, but it actually turns out that we're easily able to make this kind of modification either with uh, torches that uh, burn away the steel, or lasers, or water cutting. Water cutting, uh, most people are shocked to discover that you can cut something with water, but if we can compress water to about 50,000 pounds per square inch, which we can, and shoot it out in a very fine jet, we can actually cut uh, six to eight inch thick steel plate with a fair amount of precision. Now this is not just water, the water is filled with uh, granular potter particles which are extremely hard and those abrasive particles actually do most of the cutting. It's very impressive to watch though because when you watch this little needle of water come out of the nozzle it doesn't seem like much, but then it just slices through pieces of steel, like almost like they're butter. All right, so this uh, welded connection here is a shop connection, and the bolted connections between these clip angles and the girder, uh, those bolted connections occur in the field. Now the advantage to all this is the the secondary beam is continuous all the way up to this face of these clip angles and that gets carried all the way to the center line or to the web of the primary member or in other words the girder and therefore delivers no torsional influence to the girder so this shows that kind of connection and this by the way is the standard connection so here you have the secondary wide flange beam here you have the primary wide flange beam, so this is a joist and that's a girder. Um, here we have those clip angles which typically are on both sides, but in some very lightweight applications they might even just be on one side. But here we have a clip angle which was shop welded to the web of this wide flange and now the bolted connection is occurring to the web of the primary beam. This is the standard connection of this sort. Um, we'll talk, when we talk about integrated systems, in the next few videos we'll show examples where actually this wide flange is put up on top of this uh, primary girder or primary beam or girder and uh, that's done to allow airflow over the top of the girder but that's a fairly unconventional or recent sort of development and this is the, the normal way, this is the conventional way in which these secondary beams are attached to the primary beams. Okay, so as we mentioned, we have substantial amounts of torsion 
uh, associated with the wide flange shape. And if we draw a cross section, we see something like the following. The shear forces that are induced under that kind of force begin to go, they go along this edge, then they curl around, they go this way, and they loop all around, and they eventually come to closure in this manner. Now, when you think about how this section is performing in terms of what are the forces and what are the lever arms of those forces to resist this torsional effect, because remember, torsion is a kind of moment and moment requires a decent moment arm or lever arm. So here we've taken two forces and we've coupled them together and we discover that they have a pretty small lever arm between them. The lever arm in fact is less on average than the thickness of the flange. And likewise we can couple these two together and any any pair of forces here and we discover that all those forces have a pretty minimal moment arm. And that explains why wide flange sections are not very effective in resisting torsion because the lever arm for all the uh, shear forces or shear effects internal to the beam are really small. In contrast to that, if we take a closed section such as a square tube or a, a round tube and we start coupling these forces together, suddenly uh, a force here and a force there that we pair together has a, a pretty major lever arm. And the same is true for the uh, circular tube. And in fact, on average, Whenever we group these forces together, the lever arm is even larger for this circular element than for the square one, assuming the wall thickness here is the same as the wall thickness there, and the total cross-sectional area is the same for the two cases. But even though we say the circular cross-section is better than the square cross-section, the difference between them is really small. It's something on the order of 5%. But the difference between this and that is huge. These lever arms are all very small. These lever arms are quite large. So these kinds of sections, closed sections or tubular sections, are much better for torsional applications. In this little experiment, you'll recall seeing this previously, this gray material is 1 16th inch thick styrene. And in this case, we've started with a certain amount of material and configured that amount of material in various ways. So here we have a square tube. It has the same cross-sectional area as this series of slabs glued together, which has the same cross-sectional area as this I section. And based on the previous arguments we just talked about, we would expect that um, the tube is going to work way better than the I-beam. And when we think about it, this slab even is going to work, this simple rectangular bar is going to work better than the I section or the wide flange section because the slab is going to have a bigger lever arm from for one stress arrow to the other across this distance. But you see a huge difference in deformation. Here there's almost no visible deformation associated with the load on this square tube. Here we're seeing a huge deformation in this I section. And notice what a tiny force we have on this I section. Here we have a very large force. And this tube is strong enough and stiff enough that we're not able to detect any significant movement. Okay, so this brings us to the following very common application. Um, we often put brick veneer on a building. So here we see some brick veneer. Typically, we like to have at least a two inch air gap behind that. Uh, the purpose of that air gap is to keep moisture away from the interior of the building. So actually this air gap 
allows water that comes through the brick. And you may, um, you've probably heard that brick is a very porous material. And if you've ever worked with brick, you'd be shocked at how porous it is. It's like a sponge. You can take a, a dry brick and drop it in water and drastically increase its weight. But you can also see the air bubbles coming out of it as the water gets sucked into it. And water can penetrate all the way through a brick and all the way through the mortar. Uh, not only are there pores in the mortar, but typically there are not perfect joints made. And so there will be little channels through the mortar, although if it's done really well, most of the water penetration through the brick and the mortar is due to this uh, porosity of the material. All right, so we have... We have bricks and they are offset by a couple of inches because we need this air gap to manage the water. And by the way, back here we'd have some flashing periodically that would come down the surface and go partially into this layer. And the purpose of that is as water penetrates through and starts to run down the inner surface of this brick, we'd like to then redirect it outward. So we have a whole bunch of these periodic uh, pieces of flashing which are there simply to uh, repetitively get water out. Um, so it's like this army of things that we incorporate to work uh, for us to constantly get water off of that interior surface and redirect it to the outside. Okay, so here we got some insulation which typically is two or two and a half inches, maybe even three inches and a really good um, insulated wall. Right here we have a shelf angle which is used to support the weight of these bricks and this shelf angle has been welded to this rectangular beam and this is a fairly recent innovation but is an incredibly logical way to do this. We know that this beam is going to have a fair amount of weight on it from the floor it's got weight on it from this brick wall. It's got this very eccentric load, which is creating a major force out here, which is tending to rotate this beam in this direction. So rather than make this beam out of a wide flange, we've made it out of a rectangular tube to resist that torsion. This beam then has got secondary, this, so this is basically a perimeter girder which is also supporting this brick. And we've bolted it back to this beam. If we wanted to weld it to this beam, the beam would help resist this girder against rotation, but we prefer not to do that kind of field welding. So these would be um, slightly oversized bolt holes to accommodate sliding the bolts in. And then the eccentric loading of this brick is handled through the torsional qualities of this uh, perimeter girder. Now that perimeter girder has got to be supported at the ends with something that provides an upward force uh, to resist gravity, but it also has to have a connection at the end that keeps it from rotating because we can have the greatest um, tubular beam in the world, but if it's not connected at the endpoints in a manner that resists it rotating, then in fact this eccentric load associated with the bricks will cause it to rotate. So that's a really crucial point that whatever that connection is, it has to prevent this portion of the beam from moving to the right and this portion from moving to the left. So this shows such a beam. In this case, this is that tubular rectangular beam. Here's some angles. These angles were galvanized because they're going to have brick on them. And it's not going to be possible to go back and fix the surfaces of them if they start to corrode. Uh, here we see some welding, which has already started a process of corrosion. So they will come back with special galvanized paints to fix that. Uh, condition. We're less concerned about this. This is somewhat rusted steel, but it's a grade of steel or a type of steel that's fairly inhibited to uh, further rust. And uh, it's not going to be subjected directly to water uh, in the way that this angle is, which has the brick resting directly on top of it.
So this shows that connection. Here we have the uh, welded clip angle attached to the side of this beam, which is the rectangular tubular beam. And then here we have our typical wide flange secondary beam, which is not subjected to any of these torsional effects and therefore doesn't need to be uh, a tubular section at all. And in this case, this shows you a slight variation. Um, because this tubular primary beam or gir perimeter girder is resistive to torsion, uh, we can actually weld this clip angle to the face of this beam. We can't get to a, a central web because there is no central web. And then these bolts can be one of two things. These are the field connected bolts. They can either be slip critical bolts that get tensioned up to the point that we're sure we don't have any rotation uh, at this connection between the clip angle and the web of this beam. Or we can simply design this particular beam so that whatever eccentric load occurs from this beam doesn't cause significant rotation of this perimeter girder of the rectangular tube that we're using for the perimeter girder. Uh, here's another view of a similar kind of connection. In this case, this uh, secondary wide flange beam has been mounted low compared to uh, this particular one. In this case, we were going to put decking and run the concrete up to that level right there. Uh, and there was a door that steps through this light gauge uh, material. And so the surface of this secondary beam had to be located down close to the midpoint. And so as a consequence, we chose this clip angle, which is attached near the bottom of this rectangular tube. And there's another clip angle on the other side. And in the end, this welded connection is more than enough to handle the loads that have to be transferred through this joint. So this shows uh, this building with some more of these rectangular tubes, which have the angles welded to them. And then the brick facade is going to get supported on these angles. And by the way, um, we talk about brick as a sort of, from a historical point of view, we tend to think of it as a compressive material, which has structural integrity. But in fact, um, a single, a single layer of brick uh, in modern construction is there to resist moisture because it doesn't rot and doesn't deteriorate under moisture. It also is not uh, impacted by ultraviolet. So the brick becomes uh, a decorative surface treatment which resists all those things but it doesn't resist the penetration of water. And so I have uh, I invent, coined the expression four inch thick paint that leaks and it's a very heavy paint but people love brick and in the end what we do is we support the brick at every floor with these shelf angles and we set the shelf angles back far enough and cover them with uh, mortar or a band of uh, some treatment there um, possibly a viscoelastic material um, so that it doesn't look like uh, it's supported in bands, but in fact, it is supported at every floor. Okay, so here we have the California Academy of Sciences. This is, uh, I think, a Renzo Piano building, and this globe inside is a Renzo Piano design. You'll notice double curved glass, which produces this beautiful sense of a truly round sphere everywhere. And inside of this, you'll notice this bridge. This is a footbridge, which is supported on this curved tubular element, which gets only supported periodically. So the portion of the span that occurs between this support and that support has a tendency to rotate because the beam is not straight. And any time the beam curves out of straightness, it has a tendency to torque over in whatever direction it's leaning towards. So in this case, uh, they've basically made this entire thing out of a round tube. And that round tube then serves in bending and spanning from there to there. And then it also uh, resists whatever torsional influences 
are being induced by the load which is being offset relative to the supports by virtue of the curvature of the beam. And here's another example. Um, here we have a curved uh, roadbed and uh, in this case they've brought it to a thin taper to the edge because they think that that's more beautiful and I tend to agree with that. Uh, on the other hand they've maintained a fairly substantial amount of tubularity in the center of this thing which is what's keeping this from torquing downward there and there uh, under the influence of whatever gravity forces are going to be on top of it. And this cross section by the way is really quite beautiful. Not only do we have this tube but the road bed or the decking uh, is like a moment diagram where we have this extreme negative moment due to this cantilever here. So we have a thickening of the material there and a thickening there but it gets thinner towards the middle where the moment stresses are not so severe. That ends our video. Um, chapter 6, Section 5, uh, Torsion in Beams.